All right. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nia Liu. I'm the director of Center for Environmental Law here at Macquarie University. My a very warm welcome to all of you to join today's uh, conference on global dialogue on biodiversity law and governance, transformative pathway to living in harmony with nature. First, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodian of the Macquarie University land, the Watamadaga clan of the Daru Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. And we sincerely pay our respects to the elders past, present and future. So before we uh, move on, uh, let's just do the, as a, as a, tra as a tradition of the uh, here in Australia, let's just do uh, the welcome to the country. Welcome. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of Macquarie University land, the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. We welcome people of all nations and all faiths. Kwai Bidja, Jamna Payala Janawi. Come here, we speak together. We have 60,000 years of archaeological evidence of Aboriginal habitation at Lake Mungo and 20,000 years in Ride. We have great antiquity. Today, hundreds of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people graduate from Macquarie University. The Darug Nation had famous leaders such as Chief Yaramundi, Naraginji, Colby and Maria Locke. Many of the descendants of these Darug people live today amongst you. We celebrate with you our ongoing attachment and custodianship of this country. We celebrate the achievements of Macquarie University. Okay, so before we uh, get started, let, let me uh, please uh, allow me to say a few words about uh, our Center for Environment Law here at Macquarie. We have a very strong history of involvement in environmental law uh, established in 1983 as probably the oldest environmental law center here in Australia, if not in the whole Southern Hemisphere. We are also a very new center uh, that we, since last year we have determined, I mean the CEL team has determined that the center will build on its research strengths and expertise in the area of biodiversity law and governance. So our mission is to drive transformative change through future-focused interdisciplinary uh, legal research that provides cutting edge solutions to the global challenge of biodiversity loss and extinction risk. And here we go, our flagship conference uh, this year with focus on biodiversity law and governance in this also this super year of so-called super year of biodiversity. I want to thank a few people for, make, uh, for making this event happen. Uh, first and foremost, our Macquarie University's fabulous events team, uh, Yulima and Danielle Fiona, led by Lynn Hunter, and our center's wonderful students volunteers, Sarah Wenderfield, uh, and also our social media volunteers, Miss Shala, Andrew, and Micah, who will tweet this event over the next three days. I also want to thank uh, <coughs> Professor Cassandra Brooks from uh, University of Colorado Boulder, uh, and also Professor Tian Baoqing from uh, Wuhan University, China, that we are <coughs> that they are co-hosting this uh, global dialogue to make it really global. And we do have large numbers of participants from both United States and China to address these sharing sharing concerns of our whole planet. And uh, and so now <coughs> let me uh, let me introduce our uh, today's uh, speaker for our opening address. Uh, our opening address will be delivered by uh, Professor Leslie Hughes, who, uh, is a, uh, who is a strong supporter of our center. Leslie sits in the uh, advisory board of our center. Uh, she's a distinguished professor of biology and pro vice chancellor here at Macquarie. She has been researching uh, the, the impacts of climate change on species and ecosystems for more than 20 years. He's a former lead author in the IPCC uh, assessment report former Federal Climate Commissioner, and also uh, a member of the 
Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists and also a director of WWF Australia. And I could go on and on and on for the whole opening panel, but I, 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 would, I, would, I would really prefer to leave the time to Leslie, who will set the scene for our three days conference. I, I just want to say, uh, Leslie will, uh, after Leslie's presentation, uh, all the uh, attendees and the panelists are welcome to uh, ask one or two burning questions before we move to launching our center's block. Okay, so Leslie, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Ningyi. Thank you uh, to you and the conference organizers for doing me the honor of asking me to open this important conference. I've been really looking forward to it. Um, my talk today, I hope, will set the scene from, from the perspective of a biologist. I'm not a lawyer, but hopefully uh, some of the things that I'll be saying um, you will recognise as having significant legal implications. So I'm going to share my screen. And I don't have a title for this talk. I thought instead I would just start with this image. This image was taken on the 7th of December um, by the crew of the Apollo 17 mission as they returned from the moon. Sorry, I should have said the, 17, the 7th of December in 1972. It was quickly dubbed the Blue Marble and it is credited with being a catalyst of the modern environment movement because for the first time, people in the world everywhere could really see the earth from space. And it was clear not only how beautiful the earth was, how fragile and lonely it was, but also how comprehensively finite was the planet. A few years ago, somebody described our interaction with the biodiversity on the planet as being like treating our species as if they were a thin green slime across the surface of the world. And I think that's a really apt metaphor that I want to explore. There's probably no single date in the year that better captures our relationship with the other species on the planet is this one, Earth Overshoot Day. It basically describes the day in the year where the human race has used an Earth's worth of resources. Back in the early 70s, we made it through till about nearly the end of December before we'd used an Earth's worth of resources. But over the last five decades, that year has been creeping inexorably earlier until in 2018, it was at the end of July. We got a slight reprieve in 2019, 2020 due to COVID. Uh, but of course, as we come out of the pandemic, it's expected that we'll keep um, creeping forward. So we now use about 1.6 worth of Earth's resources in a year. And here in Australia, where I am, if the whole world used resources like we do, Earth Overshoot Day would be at the end of March. And of course, this is the result. Our extinction rates are now 100 times that of the background fossil record. And the latest IPBS report indicated that by 2050, more than a million species of plants and animals are at risk of extinction and some much sooner than that, with many species potentially going the way of the dodo and the thylacine in, uh, in just a few years. So how has this happened? Well, unfortunately, as human populations have grown, so has species extinction. Humans are basically bad for most of the species on the planet. And it's not just us crowding everything out, it's also us and the few species that we've chosen to domesticate for our purposes. And here's some pretty extraordinary figures. So humans and their mammalian livestock comprise nearly 96% of all mammalian biomass on the planet now. 
with more than 70% of all individual birds currently alive being domesticated poultry. That's an awful lot of chickens. Less than a quarter of the Earth's land surface is substantially free of human impact. And only about 13% of oceans are estimated to also be substantially free of human impact. We divert at least 50% and possibly up to 75% of the Earth's freshwater resources for our own purposes, with one new dam being built every day on average over the past 140 years. We're pumping CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at an accelerating rate, with CO2 now being at nearly 50% higher in concentration than in pre-industrial times. And the impacts of those greenhouse gases are all around us, with 2020 being the hottest year on record and the last seven years being the seven hottest years on record, with the shocking events in Canada just in the last few weeks being a, a terrible example of those impacts. The oceans are absorbing more than 90% of the excess heat in the Earth's system, with warming now visible and detectable down to a depth of two kilometres. This is having enormous impacts on marine ecosystems, particularly coral reefs, with our own Great Barrier Reef here in Australia, for example, being subject to three mass bleaching events over the last five years, with a 50% loss of the coral. UNESCO has recently recommended that the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Site be listed as in danger, something that came as no great shock to most of us, except perhaps the Environment Minister in Australia. Sea level rise is also accelerating now at three times the rate that it was rising in the 1990s as a result of that warming and of the inflow of fresh water from the polar ice caps and from glaciers. Our oceans are also absorbing um, about 25% of the atmospheric CO2, um, with the result being that they are now 30% more acid than in pre-industrial times. And we have what is actually a fantastic global agreement to try to deal with this problem, aiming the Paris Climate Agreement, aiming to keep temperatures to less than two degrees above pre-industrial with an aspiration to keep them less than 1.5 degrees. But thus far, the pledges that countries that are signatories to that agreement have made, um, even if met 100% and on time, will lead to probably three degrees of warming. Hopefully uh, the next COP meeting in Glasgow in November um, will um, greatly increase that ambition. It's therefore really no wonder that when the Global Biodiversity Outlook was published by the UN in September 2020, um, it came to the conclusion that the world had failed to meet any of the significant targets uh, set for biodiversity on the planet. You would have to say that so far we have an F as our report card. So what must we do about it? Well, the organisers of this conference have allowed me, in fact, asked me to be quite self-indulgent about this and to give a list of things that I think we should be doing. And a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about, I believe, have very significant legal ramifications. For those, who, I'm a passionate list maker, so I'm going to give you my top 10 um, and if any of you are interested in looking up the references behind some of the things that I'm about to say, um, it, it's taken from a, an essay that I published in the Griffith Review last March. So let's start on my top 10. It's my sort of personal manifesto for the planet. Firstly, we must absolutely never give up fighting to what we, we in the environment movement technically call the big bad things, whether it's digging up and burning fossil fuels, dealing with plastic pollution, land clearing, over harvesting. We are in a constant series of battles. We win some, we lose many, but we simply can't stop fighting. 
Secondly, I believe there's some real problems with the word restoration. We hear a lot about restoring the planet, but we cannot turn the clock back. The climate is changing so rapidly that the idea that we can go back in time, I believe is utterly implausible. But what we can do is think about renovation, I think, instead of restoration. If we restore a beautiful old historic home to be used, we don't go back to candles and gas lights and chamber pots. We modernize, we take the best bits, we make it functional and beautiful and sustainable. And that's what we need to be doing with our environment. So long live the concept of renovation. Thirdly, I think we need to be far, far more bolder in our positive interventions in the environment. And in particular, I think we need to be building habitats everywhere, creating new habitat, as they said in the movie, create it and they will come. We need to be replacing all of those bare areas where we have lost habitat with new habitat. And we need to be very, very active about doing that. Fourthly, as we ourselves adapt to our changing environmental circumstances, especially climate change, we've got to be really much more careful not to completely screw up things for all of the species on the planet that we share it with. Things like building dams or bulldozing fire breaks or building seawalls are all perfectly legitimate adaptation options if the only things we are thinking about are humans, to increase our water security, to um, reduce our wildfire risk, to increase the chance that our infrastructure won't be washed away. They're all perfectly understandable responses to changing climate, but all of them have enormous negative consequences for other species. We need to look for other ways to adapt to climate change uh, that does not harm everything else. Fifthly, I believe we need to face up to our cognitive dissonance in terms of environmental management. Cognitive dissonance, of course, is the ability to keep two or more completely uh, antagonistic emotions in our heads at the same time. What I mean by this is that, unfortunately, in most countries, it is far easier to do negative things for the environment, like clear land and basically destroy habitat, than it is to do positive things. My poster child for this is this little rat shown up here on my slide. It was the Bramble Key Malomies that found its home and its only home on that tiny little sandy atoll up there in the Torres Strait between Australia and New Zealand. As you can see, it's a pretty inhospitable place to live and it's only just above sea level. The rat was in trouble. It was listed as endangered under Australian legislation. There was even a recovery plan written for it. Nothing was done. Um, sea level is rising at about twice the global average in the Torres Strait and a couple of big storms basically took out the whole island. That little, the last of the species of that rat simply drowned while no one was looking. How easy would it have been to take a few, put them on another island? Pretty low risk activity, but we could have saved it. The Bramble Key Malomies now has the global distinction of being the first mammalian extinction due to climate change. We could have saved it, it was avoidable. We didn't because we did not really take our responsibility seriously to intervene in a positive way. I believe we need to move a lot of species, even those species that are currently protected in national parks, if they are in places where the climate is going to make it impossible for them to live. Number six, we need to get back to nature, rejoice in all of our nature, even in our own backyards. Um, more than 50% of the world's population now live in urban environments. 
And for many people, an urban environment is the only nature they will ever experience. This is a picture of Singapore. Several decades ago, the Singaporeans decided they didn't just want to be a garden city, they wanted to have a city in a garden. The greatest technical um, manifestation of carbon sequestration is in our backyards. It's a tree and we need a lot more of them. Number seven, and this is the pragmatic part of me, we need to use economic arguments if we need to. There are many conservationists that are highly resistant to this idea of monetizing species, some crass neoliberal block. But I think we need to use these arguments um, when they're effective. And there are many that are effective. So the recently um, published Dasgupta review in the UK, for example, put the total global cost of subsidies that damage nature as $6 trillion per annum. These are powerful figures and we need to use them. Number eight, we need to use technology for good. I'm a big supporter, in fact, unlike many of my conservationist colleagues, of using genetic engineering and genetic modification for good. Here's just one example. This is a picture of yeast, truly one of the most remarkable um, gen genera on the planet. Researchers are now using yeast to make palm oil. Palm oil is an incredibly useful oil, and unfortunately, it's growing in palm plantation. Palm oil um, plantations have resulted in extraordinary deforestation, particularly in Southeast Asia. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could produce palm oil in a vat rather than from a tree? Let us use that sort of technology for good. Number nine, we need to also remember that we are a species too, we're part of nature. This guy here is René Descartes, um, really um, well known for being the father of modern philosophy. And I think he's got a lot to be responsible for. Descartes was the person that really popularized this notion that man, and he only spoke about man rather than the other 52% of the population, um, it should have dominion over nature, that man was separate from nature and superior to it. And that duality of Western thought has really permeated much of what we've done ever since. I do think it's uh, the wrong way of looking at people and nature. We have to be part of nature. And if we're part of nature, we'll look after it a lot better. And finally, Sometimes it can be really easy to get depressed and to give up hope. We did, do need to be humble in terms of our place in the world, but to actually consider that hope is as much a strategy as it is an emotion. One of my favorite quotes from the great Wendell Berry, which comes from his manifesto, The Mad Farmer Liberation Front is this. Barry said, be joyful, though you have considered all of the facts. I think we need to remember this. And my final slide is, oh no, sorry, before I get to my final slide, I will say that there are some reasons to be hopeful. For example, on the international um, front, the leaders pledge for nature made last September unites 84 countries from all regions of the world and the EU in their commitments to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. And the new buzz phrase is positive nature. Let's hope that that works. Last World Environment Day began the UN dec decade on ecosystem restoration. Now, notwithstanding my criticism of the word restoration, I think it could be the UN decade on ecosystem renovation. Um, hopefully what this decade means is a, a real refocus on the world around us and on the life support system that we need to protect. And here is my final slide. This is my favorite poster from the climate marches in December, 2015. I do believe we are the ones we've been waiting for, and I hope we can carry forward that responsibility into 
this conference and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Leslie. This is fascinating. And I thoroughly enjoyed your, your 10 uh, kind of a personal points of, 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 of how, how are we going to uh, live in harmony with nature in the future? And it's quite an important question to ask. And uh, I, I think we don't really have that much, that much time left, but we can have like, let's say one maybe burning question if there is any from panelists or attendee for Leslie. Okay, so this is the beginning of the day. This is the beginning of the conference. And I think people need a little bit of time to digest all this important message. So, all right. So thank you very much Les once again, Leslie. And uh, now we will just uh, uh, turn to my colleague, Paul Gowin, uh, who will be uh, in charge of our center's newly established blog, Law and Nature Dialogue, and uh, uh, say a few words about officially launching this important uh, forum for uh, publication. So Paul, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mingye. Um, thanks, everyone. So I'll just share my screen so I can bring up my slides for uh, the launch of our uh, dialogue. Thanks. Can everyone see that? Yep. Okay. Um, I'll just shift here. Okay. So uh, this week we'll be launching um, the Law and Nature Dialogue, which will be an extension of everything that we've worked hard at CELL to achieve in the last uh, nine or so months. Uh, it encapsulates our uh, commitment to biodiversity, to the transformation of, uh, of law regarding biodiversity. You can see here from the first slide, um, this is basically our, our landing page. So the, the name of it as well, Law and Nature, I think is a, an important reflection of something that Professor uh, Leslie Hughes just mentioned in her um, opening uh, talk as well. The idea that uh, humanity should be seen as part of nature. Um, so that is our, our ethic, that is our, our ethos, if you like, that we reflect not just in cell, but as I said, as an extension into this, uh, this blog that we are about to launch. Oops, sorry. Um, so this is our mission statement for the blog. Again, very, very similar to what we have um, uh, primarily as our mission statement for sell. A few things I would just like to, to um, draw your attention to, uh, not just to understand better, I think, sell and the blog's ethos, but also, of course, the people that want to contribute to the blog. And we hope that um, from the many, many wonderful speakers and presentations that we are going to be uh, lucky enough to see in the next few days, we hope that people can um, see the blog as an opportunity for further publication and uh, recognition of their work. So what do we wanna get across with this blog? We are looking here at a future focused vision for, um, for the planet. Again, we are looking at the relationship between people and nature. We are moving away, as, as Leslie mentioned, from the Descartes model of separation. We want to make sure, of course, that we emphasize transformative change through this future focus with an interdisciplinary um, interdisciplinary approach to legal research that provides cutting edge solutions. So once we are in the biodiversity space, we are not, of course, closed off to things which are to, to you know, colleagues and, and ideas which are not necessarily grounded in law. We are looking for everything that has a, uh, an important impact on the transformation and future focus of biodiversity uh, conservation, preservation, and as a Professor Hughes pointed out, renovation. So this is the example now, a little bit more of a practical view of how the blog is going to be set up. You can see here on the left of the screen, these are basically the articles that we have already, uh, or the posts rather, that we have already um, edited and are ready as part of the initial launch of the blog. You probably recognize some of the names there, myself at the top, um, Dr. Michelle Lim, who, who was part of yesterday's pre-dialogue panel, and of course, um, Associate Professor Nenye down the bottom there. Um, so thus far, we have looked in, in house to try and find material for our posts, but we also have um, posts from our ongoing webinar series as well that we run here at CELL. So again, 
for anyone interested, please um, just, just contact us and, and I'll go through the process in a moment. If you look to the right of the screen there, you'll see a very, very important step, a very important uh, mechanism, if you like, in terms of publication, uh, reach, if you like, of uh, the, the author's work. So we have um, what has very quickly become a vibrant, thriving social media presence, uh, led mainly by our Twitter feed, and you can see it there, um, the address is simply at Macquarie Cell, um, uh, Macquarie Centre for Environmental Law. It is very well branded, it is very well uh, vetted, um, it is topical, it is um, insightful, etc. And um, yeah, everything that goes on the blog will be linked to, to the Twitter account. So there's huge opportunity for people to get further exposure to, to any sort of um, idea that they'd like to, to basically get out into the world. So looking then at um, an example of a, of a slide that we have, or sorry, a, um, a post that we have produced. This is one that we saw on the previous uh, slide from um, Michelle. And uh, pandemics and unprecedented biodiversity loss, what's the connection? Now, uh, this post was based um, on a, uh, a piece that Michelle had um, written and, and previously published elsewhere. But with the permission of, um, of the editors, we were able to take um, most of that work, uh, change it um, slightly as need be for our purposes, and then publish it here. Now that's not all we want to do. We would love to get original content, uh, but basically um, this is, I think, a, a good example of what we've um, done thus far. And it's to also show, of course, that yeah, again, with some modifications, there is another uh, platform for your work to be uh, published and to be um, to get to get extra exposure. Now, another thing to point out quickly here is that Michelle authored this with um, Gabrielle Clark, Gabby, one of our um, volunteers here at the Center for Environmental Law. So that's not just an opportunity for our own uh, volunteers and own students at Macquarie. It's an opportunity for, for students more broadly as well, particularly though HDR uh, candidates um, globally. If indeed, uh, again, if you want um, further exposure for your work, uh, feedback indeed, and if things like conferences or, or of course journal articles, um, which are much more laborious, uh, is not an option immediately, please you know, contact us, please send us what your ideas, send us your draft, and, uh, and we'll look to, to sort of um, hopefully collaborate with you in the publication of that. Moving on then to the final slide, and this is of course um, more of a recognition, I think an acknowledgement of the people who have really uh, dug deep, have really worked incredibly hard to ensure that our uh, social media presence has been, um, as I said, a rapidly burgeoning social media presence and one that has set a uh, dynamic but also very, very stable platform now for the launch of our blog. Um, you can ignore me on the left there. Uh, really, the focus should be on the other three people here. So um, again, all three are volunteers at, at CELL, um, Micah, Mishala, and Andrew, um, they will all be uh, working behind the scenes uh, primarily uh, through the um, duration of the global dialogue, mainly on our Twitter feed, but of course we'll field any inquiries from anyone about, um, about contributions to the blog. So any, your contribution, if you're thinking immediately of doing something can be whatever you've presented here um, in the course of the global dialogue. It can be something you have on the back burner it can be some an idea that just hasn't perhaps yet reached um, that level of maturity in order to translate it into a journal article or a conference paper, anything like that. Uh, we are here to basically facilitate these uh, important global inter interdisciplinary discussions on biodiversity and biodiversity law. Okay, so that is basically it really um i hope that um yeah you know we can really launch this with a bit of gusto in the next few days i think it would be fantastic a fantastic opportunity on the background of the global dialogue uh just basically just a couple more things just really quick if um there is that the site will only launch um uh probably tomorrow morning because we just had one tiny problem with uh, converting it onto mobile but all the rules and everything else for for submission are there so that's it for me. Thanks uh, again for everyone for, for being here. This is gonna be a fantastic conference and I'll pass back over to, to Ninja.
Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, so, uh, so just watch out, everyone, that we will be actively soliciting your contributions to <laughs> our blog in the uh, near future. So now let's just immediately, immediately move to our first panel of this conference, uh, Special Protection of Southern Ocean. So may I invite the chair and also all the panelists to turn on their video. And uh, uh, Professor Tang, uh, the floor is yours now from uh, this moment onwards. And the panelists, please uh, turn on your video. And of course, myself is also a panelist. So, uh, all right. So, uh, let's move into serious discussions. Okay. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And uh, thank you, Professor Liu, and thank you, co hosts for inviting me to attend this meeting. I'm pleased to chair this special session. And um, as we see that we today, we have four very important speakers in this special session on protect the South Ocean. And uh, I'm, uh, as a chair, I will announce two things. Uh, first, first, each speaker will have uh, 10 or maximum 15 minutes. And uh, I will remind uh, she or her, uh, her or him when he uh, just have, uh, when he or she had just have two minutes left in terms of 15 minutes. And uh, as, to, as for the attendees, I, I just uh, draw your attention to the Q and functions. If you have any questions relating to the four speakers, and put your questions in the Q and A functions, and uh, we will have them discussed after our speakers finish the presentations. Then we, I would like to introduce the. Our first speaker, Dr. Cassandra Brooks. Professor Brooks uh, is a assistant professor in environment study at the University of Colorado Broad. She draws a diversity of disciplines, including marine science, environment policy, and science communication to study and seek solutions to pressing environment problems. She has a passion for Antarctic, Antarctica with the last 50 years of her career focused on marine science and the conservation in the region. Today, her topic is leadership in conserving global commons, protecting the rosy Antarctica. So the floor is yours, Professor Brooks. Thank you so much, Professor Tang. It's really a pleasure to have you here with us today. And it's a pleasure to be presenting today. So I will just quickly share my screen. And can folks see my slides and hear me? Excellent, wonderful. Well, I need to start by taking you all to Antarctica, this icy continent at the bottom of the world. And I wanna share with you that before the continent was discovered, the ancient Greeks insisted that a great southern land must exist in symmetry with the north. Without it, they said, the entire world would topple over. And I love this metaphor because the Greeks were actually right. Because since its discovery, scientists have documented that the Antarctic stores 90% of the world's freshwater, it regulates our global climate, and it drives uh, global ocean circulation. And despite its harsh conditions, Antarctic waters actually teem with life. Indeed, the Antarctic contains some of our last healthy marine ecosystems left in the world. Part of the reason we have healthy marine ecosystems is that Antarctica has been protected by ice and remoteness, but also political will. In the Antarctic, we have a rich history of science and exploration that has created a framework for international collaboration. And I wanna highlight in particular the 1957-58 International Geophysical Year, which led directly to a political collaboration and the signing of the Antarctic Treaty in 1959 at the height of the Cold War, which sets aside the entire continent for the sake of peace and science. 
Now, under the Antarctic Treaty System is the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, or CAMELAR, which manages the waters around Antarctica. In line with the principles of the treaty, grounded in science and precaution, CAMELAR is actually considered a leader in marine resource management. They currently have 26 member states who meet every year over two weeks in Hobart, Australia, to negotiate policy decisions, all of which are made by consensus. And currently, there are two main commercial fisheries in the Southern Ocean. The largest is for Antarctic krill, which are a small shrimp-like crustacean that are, support the entire Southern Ocean food web. And the other main fishery is actually for Patagonian and Antarctic toothfishes, which are the top fish predator, and they're sold as Chilean sea bass. And there's increasing pressure to fish these species in line with global fishing trends. Indeed, as this figure shows you, 90% of our global fisheries are either fully exploited, overexploited, or collapsed, meaning that fishing vessels have to venture deeper and into more remote waters, putting increasing pressure on expanding fishing in the Southern Ocean. Meanwhile, the system is struggling to adapt to climate change. The Antarctic is among the fastest changing places on Earth, and these physical changes threaten the health of Antarctic marine ecosystems. So what do we do? Well, marine protected areas are areas where human activities are restricted to meet specific conservation protection or fisheries management objectives, are an increasingly popular tool for conserving marine biodiversity and managing fisheries, including offering resilience to the impacts of climate change. And MPAs were actually always part of the CAMLAR Convention under Article 9, which allowed for closing areas for science or conservation. And in 2002, in line with global agreements, CAMLAR actually committed to a Southern Ocean network of MPAs. And in 2009, they adopted the world's first international MPA um, south of the South Orkney Islands, and you can see it on the map in front of you in yellow. So this emerging movement towards MPAs in the Southern Ocean, which conflicts with these most remote fisheries and one of the world's last resource frontiers, poses a timely and relevant opportunity to study a collective action problem and to ask the question of under what conditions do communities conserve the global commons? So here today I'm presenting to you results from a five-year case study of the Kamler MPA process focused specifically on the Ross Sea. I took a deep case study approach. I'm not going to go into the details, only to say it was a lot of methods that I employed in the case study, including interviews and observations and document analysis and mapping. Um, and a lot of this detail is actually in the publication uh, from 2020 published in Conservation Letters. So all this, all this detail is there. And I focus on the Ross Sea because among scientists, conservationists, and national governments, the Ross Sea was a priority area for protection at CAMLAR. In a global assessment of impacts on the world's oceans, the Ross Sea actually was deemed to be the healthiest large marine ecosystem left in the world. And the figure in front of you is demonstrating that. So again, remembering that all decisions at CAMLAR are made by consensus, I wanna walk you through this process of getting all the CAMLAR members to agree. And at the time of the Ross Sea negotiations, it was 24 member states plus the EU who all had to agree. And for the sake of time, I'm going to start in 2012 when a proposal for the Rossi MPA was first brought to CAMLAR by the United States and New Zealand. But please know that there was a decade of work by scientists underpinning this proposal. And in 2002, more than um, half of the CAMLAR states actually supported this first version of the proposal. You can see those states on the curve. In 2013, after a high profile special meeting of the commission and the scientific committee, and after reduction in size of the MPA removing northern areas, more states joined in consensus. And in 2014, even more states joined, leaving China and Russia as the last two states who did not support a Rossi MPA. Now, if you haven't noticed already, negotiations moved relatively slowly over the course of many years as, as we inch towards consensus at CAMLAR. And Interviews I conducted in 2014 actually suggested that getting consensus was very complicated. They described the CAMLAR scene, and this is negotiations over the MPA, as antagonistic, hostile, stagnant, stalled, divided, that the MPA process was ruined, deadlock, at a dead end, that there was no road open, no hope, and that positions had become entrenched, finding commonality was difficult, the process had gone on too long, becoming divisive and polarized, and some even alluding to that trust was gone or broken in CAMLAR. And again, this is interviews discussing the MPA process. So some of this 
some of this uh, lack of trust was based on accusations that MPA boundaries were based on historic historic sovereignty claims. And while these claims are suspended under the Antarctic Treaty, they often drive where countries conduct science and where they lead on conservation initiatives. There was also an issue of unequal and unequal economic trade offs. So in the map in front of you, red circles are areas where we have major krill fisheries, green circles are areas of toothfish fisheries. And hopefully what you can see is a lot of the green circles actually fall north of the treaty area, and thus in exclusive economic zones of individual countries, some of which who were leading on MPAs. In fact, the only large toothfish fishery, which is open to all Kamlar countries, is in the Ross Sea. And indeed, the Ross Sea MPA ended up being designed a lot around accommodating fishing interests. And I'll illustrate that here. So in front of you is a map of the Ross Sea MPA as it was presented in 2015. The black line are the boundaries of the MPA. And the blue underpinning it was a conservation ranking that was done by United States scientists. And just to summarize for you, the darkest blue areas are the areas that are most important for, for predators and species that live in the Ross Sea. And you can see that a lot of the very dark areas actually fall within the boundaries of the MPA. But a major dark blue area, Islan Bank, actually fell outside the boundaries. And the reason for this is commercial fishing. So in yellow are the major commercial fishing grounds in the Ross Sea. And you can see that that major uh, piece of fishing really occurs on the Islam Bank. It's a highly productive area. And the MPA was designed to try to accommodate that, saying, OK, we know the major fishing is there. Let's do our best to protect the core conservation areas, but allow some fishing. And you can see there is a lot of that dark blue on the Ross Sea Shelf and Slope that is still in the MPA. And the last piece I want to highlight is the special research zone or the SRZ, and you can see that in the top part of the map. And that area is where it's still within the MPA, it has a reduced level of fishing, but some research fishing and some commercial fishing that has um, support for the tag recapture program for toothfish. So these are some of the trade offs that happen during negotiations. So and then in front of you, I want to give you a sense of the fishing that happens in the Southern Ocean. Each flag is a vessel from a country that notified to fish in the last year. And you can see that it is a very busy space. And so this idea of protected areas that might actually interfere with current fishing interests, but also the idea that they might interfere with future fishing interests, fishing that might happen in the future that we're not doing right now, and the precedent that we might set by designating these large protected areas. So, of course, there are also external issues outside of Kamlar that were impacting Ross Sea MPA negotiations. As I mentioned, the United States, together with New Zealand, was leading the charge on a Ross Sea MPA. And geopolitical tensions with Russia were very detrimental to negotiations over the course of many of these years. In fact, many interviewees described a Cold War feel in the room during MPA negotiations. Now, meanwhile, Outside the Kamlar negotiation room, scientists from across the world were putting pressure on Kamlar, calling for protection for the Ross Sea to have a living laboratory for studying how a healthy marine ecosystem functions. Global conservation groups generated a flood of media, policy reports, and outreach advocating for the Ross Sea, and millions of public citizens actually engaged in the campaign. Ultimately, these communities actually got the attention of former Secretary of State in the United States, who then committed to working at the highest level towards a Ross Sea MPA. In fact, due to John Kerry's efforts, President Obama was able to incorporate a Ross Sea MPA into climate negotiations with China in 2015. And this facilitated China's support for a Ross Sea MPA. They also negotiated adding a krill research zone and limited duration for the MPA, potentially protecting future interests. Negotiations resumed in 2016, presenting a potential political window of opportunity with Russia isolated and Secretary Kerry's term coming to an end. There was also a real opportunity for Russian leadership as Russia was chairing the meeting and had a new minister of ecology and it was coming up on celebrating the 200th anniversary of purportedly discovering the continent. And indeed, on October 28th, 2016, after 10 years of working towards this effort, including five years of intensive negotiations, Kamlar finally came to consensus to adopt the world's largest marine protected area in the Ross Sea, Antarctica. And I wish you all could have been there because in that moment, the room literally exploded in applause. Nations were hugging nations. And it became clear that this was not just an environmental win and a gift to the future generations. And of course, it was both those things. But it was like the signing of the Antarctic Treaty as a peace treaty in the height of the Cold War. This was a diplomatic win and showed that despite tensions between some countries, the Antarctic continues to be a space 
exceptional space dedicated to peace and science. And in front of you is actually a map of the Rossi MPA that the Kemmler Secretariat printed after its adoption and invited all the delegates to come and sign it. And it was clearly, it was an immediate source of pride for Kamalar. So reflecting back, how did we get consensus on a Rossi MPA? Well, we worked at that intersection of science, policy, and the public. That's really how this happened. And I really can't underestimate the role of public engagement that happened along the way, the huge scientific effort Although I didn't have time to talk about those two things, but the things that I really want to highlight in terms of the states negotiating at Camlar is the high level diplomacy, the trade offs that were negotiated, including overfishing, the building and at times breaking and rebuilding trust that happened, and working with opportunities for leadership, which all led to this political window of opportunity. And the Rossi MPA is just a start. You can see it there at the bottom of the map in blue. Camel are actually committed to a network of MPAs that would represent biodiversity in key e ecological areas throughout the Southern Ocean. There are three more critically important MPAs under negotiation at Camelar, including in the East Antarctic, the Weddell Sea, and the Western Antarctic Peninsula. You can see them all on the map in front of you. And I'm looking forward to seeing these negotiations resume in October. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Brooks. And uh, thank you for your excellent uh, presentation. Your presentation, I, I thought, I think that to bring us back to five or six years ago, that's very interesting. That um, I, I can I, I can agree with uh, your, with, with you that um, the science is very important in this. Uh, uh, in this process. And um, thank you, thank you for your presentation. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Nicole Branson. Nicole Branson <coughs> works on the Pure Charitable Trust Protecting Antarctica South Ocean Project, which focuses on the conserving an area that encompasses 10% of the world's ocean through the creation and network of the large scale marine protected areas around Antarctica. Since joining Pew in 2014, she helped to secure a MPA designation for the Antarctica Sea. An extension of our eco ecosystem based management measures for Antarctica Korea fisheries and the 100% observer coverage of career fishing vessels. Branson holds a bachelor degrees in biology, ecology, behavior and evolution from University of California, San Diego Division of the Biological Science. Today, she, her topic is the NGO's rule in the establishment of MPA in the South Ocean. Nico Branson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Tang, and thank you to the conveners for having me speak at this session. It's a pleasure to be here in esteemed company. So I'm going to share my screen now. Can you see it? Okay, great. Oops, sorry. I'm how, is that the right view there? Perfect, thanks. Okay, so thank you for the lovely introduction. So I'm actually gonna slip in one more thing to my talk, which is why do we want to protect the biodiversity of the Southern Ocean? Why is it so important? And uh, you know, why do we wanna work on this? So Cassandra hinted at some of these things, but uh, the Southern Ocean biodiversity was, it's very important because the Southern Ocean was actually the last ocean discovered. So some of the biodiversity is still only being discovered today. There's a ton of unique biodiversity because the biodiversity there is adapted to the extreme conditions. And there's high levels of endemism with thousands of species found in the Southern Ocean that aren't found anywhere else on Earth. And in order to live in harmony with nature, you know, we need to protect this biodiversity. 
Um, some scientists have identified ecosystem services that are provided by the Southern Ocean's biodiversity. There's a large range of them, um, which have been highlighted here. So fisheries project products, as Cassandra was saying, krill and toothfish, genetic resources, biochemicals, medicines, and pharmaceuticals, which are only being discovered. Um, the potential for the use of fresh water one day, if, if we need to do that. Uh, air quality regulation, climate regulation, waste treatment um, through the biogeochemical processes in the Southern Ocean, photosynthesis and primary producti productivity, uh, nutrient cycling, spiritual and religious values, tourism and recreation, and last but not least, aesthetic values. So there are a number of threats to the Southern Ocean, the largest of which are climate change and fishing, but also pollution and tourism. So protection of the Southern Ocean, uh, Cassandra talked about this a bit, but I just wanted to share some numbers with you. So the Southern Ocean, uh, the shape here that you see is actually the Kamler Convention area. And those waters encompass about 10% of the global ocean. So with the existing marine protected areas in the Southern Ocean, Cassandra talked a lot about the Ross Sea. There's also a number of protected areas in um, territorial waters of various nations in the Southern Ocean. And so these existing protected areas in the Southern Ocean come to about 1.33% of the global ocean. Now those Proposals that are currently being considered by CAMLAR, which were mentioned in the East Antarctic, the Antarctic Peninsula, and the Weddell Sea, would add an additional 1.6% of the global ocean. So together, that would be about 2.4%. But that's not all. There are additional areas that CAMLAR is thinking about protecting in the future, and conversations are happening now, and plans are starting to uh, prepare the creation of NPA proposals for the Bellinghausen Sea, uh, the Maud Rise next to the Weddell Sea, and the Subantarctic region. And these areas could potentially protect an additional one and a half percent of the global ocean. So altogether, uh, that would be a total of upwards of 3.6 percent of the ocean. If that were protected by 2030, that would be a massive contribution to this 30 by 30 ocean protection goal that a lot of global leaders and scientists are calling for. So we can see the Southern Ocean is very significant in terms of global ocean biodiversity protection. So now I'm gonna pivot and talk about the role of NGOs. So I work for the Protecting Antarctica Southern Ocean Project at the Pew Charitable Trust, which is one of the programs of the Pew Charitable Trusts. And Pew was established in 1948. It's a global non-governmental organization that seeks to improve public policy, inform the public, and invigorate civic life officially. So Pew is one of several organizations that is a member of the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, or ASOC for short, which is the official NGO observer at CAMLAR meetings. This is the ASOC coalition during one of the last times we were all together in Hobart during the annual CAMLAR meeting. So what is ASOC's role in CAMLAR? So ASOC is composed of dues paying member organizations like Pew, WWF, Greenpeace and others, um, and a number of campaigners in different countries. ASOC is, as I mentioned, an official observer at CAMLAR meetings, which means that we are able to submit papers to the meetings, participate in some of the intersessional discussions, and make interve intervention statements during the CAMLAR meetings themselves. So ASOC acts as the voice of global civil society and advocates for the Antarctic Treaty System as a whole to implement the ideals and the principles of the Antarctic Treaty. So Pew goals, um, pretty similar to you know, ASOC goals, we want to help Kamler governments with their own goals of achieving the objective of the Kamler Convention. So some of the main things that we're currently focused on and will be focused on in the future are progressing ecosystem-based management for the Antarctic krill fishery, as well as a network of large-scale MPAs for the Southern Ocean. And how do we do this? Uh, we do it through supporting science, through policy outreach, and through a variety of communications work. So some of the science that we've recently supported, I wanted to highlight a few projects. 
So um, some things we've done recently are supporting various Kamler governments with the um, resources to have the capacity to design MPAs, as well as to improve MPA research and monitoring plans. Um, in krill management world, we've supported the development of a risk assessment model, which is being used to inform the krill fisheries management so that it minimizes the impact on krill dependent predators. And then we also supported two different researchers who led different ecosystem models that um, looked at the effectiveness of the Antarctic Peninsula MPA proposal and how effective that would be under future warming scenarios and the impact of that MPA on the ecosystem and the fishery and actually found that it had positive impacts on the fishery and the ecosystem both. So that was um, some exciting science to be associated with. This is another one of um, a, a project that I was really excited about. We helped to provide some logistical organization support to a series of workshops about krill fishery management. So the workshops were formally hosted by the Kamlar scientific representatives from the US and the UK. And we um, helped with the logistics, we helped to organize and give them the space to have the conversations that hadn't been able to happen during Kamlar, just due to limited time in Kamlar. And so during that meeting, the scientists came up with the list of actions they, that they thought were critical for advancing krill ecosystem-based management. And then they turned around the following week during the formal um, working group on ecosystem monitoring and management and used you know, the discussions in that workshop to develop a work plan that was then adopted by Kamlar. And that is the plan that Kamlar is operating off of to um, revise the fisheries management system, basically. So communications, we do a lot of different communications work, a lot of different types of things. Uh, a lot of it falls into, you know, the, um, the boundary space of being science communication. We make a lot of fact sheets, work directly with the media, do podcasts. Um, actually, Nungay was in a podcast that uh, we, we worked on together with China Dialogue. Um, maps, blogs, short videos, online story maps, social media. This is a snapshot here of a video we did um, that was based on a science piece about the role of krill in biogeochemical cycles. And um, I thought that was just a really exciting piece to make. So if you have a moment, you can go check out here. Just, just Google um, krill carbon and uh, you should be able to find this video. And then um, on the policy side of things, uh, one of the main approaches that we use is just speaking directly with the Kamler delegates and scientists. So through building and maintaining relationships, we're able to learn about the needs of the various Kamler parties and um, how we can help them. So here's an event that we organized at one of the recent Kamler meetings with ASOC and WWF. And then finally, um, we have to celebrate our wins when they happen. So after the Ross CMPA was designated in 2016, Pew had a big event to celebrate, which included participation from, at the time, US Secretary of State, John Kerry, who Cassandra mentioned had gotten really engaged in the Ross CMPA process. So in summary, uh, the Southern Ocean boasts unique biodiversity, which has only recently been discovered, yet it's under threat. Intact Southern Ocean ecosystems provide a wide variety of ecosystem services to the globe, including global climate regulation to genetic resources. Creation of the full network of Southern Ocean MPAs by 2030 could add about 3.6% to the amount of global ocean protected in total. The Pew Charitable Trusts works with ASOC to help Kamler governments and um, Scientists achieve the objectives of the Kamler Convention and NGO approaches include supporting science, communication work, and policy outreach. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. And thank you for saving time, actually. And, um, and your presentation, I think that is a very, very good uh, example for us to understand to what contribution NGOs um, have made to the South Ocean conservation. And very uh, that in particular, the PO 
PO Charitable Trust. Thank you. And um, our next speaker is uh, Emily Nicotto. Emily Nicotto is um, a PhD candidate in Environment Study Program at the University of Colorado Boulder, a New Jersey native. She received her a bachelor degree from Stony Brook University in Coastal Science, and then went to the receive the master degree from University of Maine in Marine Policy, where she studied the marine protected area in area beyond national jurisdiction. Her research interests include marine science, international environment policy, and science communication. Currently, Emily is studying high sea governance via camera and the BBNG treaty. Emily, uh, today at the topic that many Nikat will bring us is key considerations for high sea conservation. Lessons from the camera and the OSPA. Emily, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Let me pull up screen. Can you all see the screen and hear me? Okay, perfect. Awesome. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, today, as was mentioned, I'll be highlighting some work um, that I've been doing on MPA frameworks and criteria as well as their application to the high seas, specifically in the form of high seas marine protected areas. Okay. So frameworks and criteria allow for the comparison of MPAs using a common set of guidelines and rules. For example, um, comparing two different MPAs within the same national jurisdiction or even different MPA zones of a singular MPA. Frameworks and criteria also act as guides for practitioners, managers, and decision makers, as these guides tend to represent the best practices for marine conservation. They will list things such as prohibited activities and allowed activities. They will allow for a traditional and cultural use, uh, environmental education, as well as traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, for the work that I'm presenting today, I'll be referencing three different of uh, these criteria and frameworks. The first being the IUCN guidelines, um, which are the 2019 version. So there was a previous 2008 version. Uh, I will be talking about the regulations based classification system, as well as the MPA guide, which is forthcoming. So it's yet to be published. The IUCN guidelines are based on factors such as prohibited and allowed activities within a marine protected area, as well as the role of the objectives of the MPA specifically, such as conservation objectives related to a specific species or protecting a specific ecosystem feature. Regulation-based classification system is a global classification system for MPAs that's actually based around a mathematical formula. And that formula takes into account types of gear, the impact of those different fishing gears, the scale of the fishing that's occurring, so in this case recreational or commercial, as well as aspects such as aquaculture, seabed exploration, uh, boating and anchoring. Lastly is the MPA guide, which is a bit of a combination. So the MPA guide includes aspects of that regulation-based classification system, as well as other measures such as stage of establishment, um, mining, dredging, boating, so it's a, it's a more comprehensive. And I use these frameworks and criteria to evaluate the current existing high seas MPAs. So right now in the high seas, there are nine different MPAs. Seven of those are under the control of the OSPAR Commission through a collective agreement with the Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission. And this other two have been already alluded to. Uh, there's the Rossi MPA, as well as the South Orkney Islands MPA that's under the jurisdiction of CAMLAR. Using QDA software in vivo, I've also started to qualitatively code these different frameworks and criteria to identify aspects that may prove to be not applicable to high seas MPAs or even a little less applicable than their national jurisdictional counterparts. So this coding is ongoing. If anyone's ever coded in in vivo, you know it is a very iterative, long process, but uh, the the coding has already started to re reveal some of these broad themes. So each of these represent an area that is important to MPAs in national jurisdiction, 
but may take on a new meaning or honestly no meaning at all in the high seas when discussing high seas conservation. For today, because of our limited amount of time together, I'll be focusing specifically on fishing within high seas MPAs and using the Ross Sea as a case study for that. So as you have heard already, the Ross Sea MPA was created through consensus by Camelar member states. It's split into three different zones, the GPZ, which encompasses about 80% of the entire Ross Sea Marine Protected Area, as well as the Special Research Zone, or RS. SRZ and the Krill Research Zone, or KRZ. Within the general protection zone, all commercial fishing is banned. The only type of fishing that can occur within the GPZ is research fishing, which is codified under Camelot's Conservation Measure 2401. And 2401 applies to the entire Camelot Convention area. It's not specific to the Ross Sea MPA. Within the special research zone, commercial tooth fishing is allowed, though it is limited to 15% of the total allowable catch for the Ross Sea region. Additionally, member states that fish for toothfish within the SRZ are required to do additional tagging of the toothfish to support a data poor area. So not a lot is known about toothfish in Antarctica and having research that is reliant on the fisheries is important because it can be very difficult to get fisheries independent research. Within the SRZ and the krill research zone, commercial krill fishing can occur under conservation measure 5104. And similarly, member states that participate in that krill fishing must also do some information gathering via krill surveys or through monitoring krill dependent predators. And all of these fishing based conservation measures are in line with the Rossi MPA objectives, as well as CAMLAR's overall objectives. And again, because of the remoteness of the Ross Sea MPA, fisheries independent research can be few and far between. So there is a reliance on the fishing industry to be providing the scientific information in line with the idea of best available science. So it is apparent that fishing does and can occur within the Ross Sea MPA, but what makes it different, especially for that general protection zone, that makes up the majority of the Rossi MPA is the process that goes into allowing for such fishing. This graphic outlines the research fishing process, so the Conservation Measure 2401 process. Research proposals are submitted by member states to CAMLAR to the relevant working groups. There's SAM, which is Statistics Assessment and Modeling, as well as FSA or Fish Stock Agreement or Assessment, excuse me, other UN term. Uh, and these working groups review those proposals. In October, the scientific committee reviews the advice from those working groups and includes their own advice on those research proposals. At the close of the annual meeting, the scientific committee drafts formal meeting reports with, the advice, with advice for the commission to review. And it's up to the commission again to decide via consensus. And so this research fishing is not done what I'll call willy-nilly. It is a long and iterative process that requires the support of working groups of different member states and in the end complete consensus. This differs from uh, the other version of high seas MPAs over an OSPAR commission. So the Northeast Atlantic high seas MPAs are formed through a collective agreement and so the Northeast Fisheries, Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission or NEAFC is in charge of all related fishing. And so there is not these requirements that go into supporting best available science necessarily. It is commercial fishing um, with less regard for total allowable catch. Um, and really the, the, main, the main protections over in the Northeast Atlantic are focused on vulnerable marine ecosystems and bottom fishing. So when you take this Ross Sea Marine Protected Area and you evaluate it within these three different frameworks, you see that there are two kind of very different results. So there's without these fishing considerations, which show that at best, um, the score will be moderately protected. And the uh, bottom piece is adapted from the regulation-based classification system. It has kind of the best fitting level of unprotected, it's not an MPA to full protection. 
And you'll notice that on the IUCN, the general protection zone actually is considered fully protected. And this is because the IUCN guidelines themselves have a piece that allow for research fishing, fishing that's um, extractative, that you can take the fish out in very specific scenarios. So it's not a end all be all, but it will allow for it. However, IUCN also prohibits all form of commercial fishing, fishing full stop. So the special research zone and the curl research zone would be considered incompatible. With the regulation-based classification system, you see that the majority of them got poorly across the board because of the level of fishing, especially because it's happening at a commercial rather than recreational level. And so when you see this without discerning the nuances of high seas fishings that occur, you can see that the raw sea is not necessarily being registered as a highly or fully protected MPA. When these considerations are taken into account, however, the general protection zone can actually be considered a de facto no-take zone. And the scientific utility and contributions of CM 5104 and 4109 are fully realized, resulting in an overall score of highly to fully protected. Again, the IUCN is very strict especially when it comes to commercial fishing. So you'll see that that did not change at all, but you can see that based on the regulation-based classification system, as well as the MPA guide, we are seeing a stronger level of protection. The MPA guide allows for the most changes because it utilizes both that regulations-based classification system and allows for evaluators to add in additional details within the citation and notes section meaning that it does have some human influence and subjection to it. For example, explaining these nuances. So while this work is still ongoing, some key takeaways that are apparent from this piece is that fishing at the research level and potentially at the commercial level can be viewed as beneficial to promote research and striving towards this best available science that is so ingrained in marine conservation and within CAMLAR so long as the process in which this occurs is a rigorous one. Additionally, these frameworks will need to be amended for the context of high seas conservation, especially with this forthcoming BB&J treaty out of the United Nations that will outline the establishment and use of MPAs within those areas beyond national jurisdiction. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. Thank you for your attention. It's very interesting to note that uh, you made uh, you made the comparison between the camera on the Rossi MPA and uh, the OSPA and the NIAP. It's very interesting to see these compar comparative studies, and uh, you have made uh, some very interesting uh, summaries or conclusions. And, uh, about, for instance, um, MPAs and the fisheries and uh, MPA, uh, fisheries and the science. Uh, that's very interesting. Um, thank you. Anyway, um, <clears throat> and before we move to the last speaker, I want I just want to remind uh, the uh, the attendees that you can uh, put some questions in the Q and A functions. Uh, 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 and after the, the last speaker finished his presentation, we will take all your uh, questions together. And uh, last but not least, our last speaker is one of the co-hosts co and Professor Liu. Professor Liu <clears throat> uh, is Associate Professor and the Director of the Center for Environmental Law at the Macro University in Sydney, Australia. Professor Liu is the leading editor of two books, the European Union and the, the Arctic, and, and governing the marine living resources in the polar regions. And he has published more than 15 referred journal articles in the book's char charters. Professor Liu has presented uh, uh, research results in more than 30 countries across the five continents. He is currently the co-chair of the International Environmental Law Interest Group, American Society of International Law. Uh, today, 
His topic is uh, regulating research fishing in the South Ocean NPAs and comparative lessons. A very interesting topic. Um, Professor Liu, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the kind introduction, uh, Professor Tang. And uh, everyone, you, you might be curious, why did I put the Antarctic panel as the first panel of, of this whole conference? Uh, the logic behind this, uh, we, we, we tend to start from uh, somewhere that is untouched and then move into the more kind of a, uh, uh, <clears throat> more, more uh, impact, uh, Ten, then we move into the areas that has been uh, more intensely impacted by human activities. But as, as elaborated by Cassandra, uh, Nikki, and Emily, even Antarctica now is not untouched. It's relatively untouched, but it has been hugely impacted by human activities as well, uh, not to mention climate change. So uh, I will, my presentation will be very brief, uh, thanks to uh, three uh, previous speakers, a fantastic introduction about the Rossi, uh, Rossi region MPA and also that's kind of my paper's focus. So this this is this is a long overdue paper uh, co-authored with two German colleagues, uh, Professor Alexander Pross and Dr. Valentin Schatz, uh, which is funded by the German uh, Acad German Academic Exchange Service (DAD) and the Universities of Australia in our Australia Germany Joint Research Scheme. We we published one paper on the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement, which entered into force on the 25th of June last month, and this is. The, the Southern Ocean one. So as lawyers, we tend to look into more details of what has uh, been achieved in, in the text. And that's why the Ross Sea region MPA is very interesting because indeed uh, it has been agreed in 2016 and entered into force in 2017. And I don't really need to go into details with all the zones. And generally uh, there are three interesting zones in the Ross Sea region MPA. Uh, general protection zone, creo research zone, and uh, and also the special research zone. And they, as you can see, the gen most I think seventy around seventy eighty percent of the of the Rossi MPA is dedicated to the general protection zone, which is largely interpreted as interpreted as a no take zone. But we do have a quite large large areas of creo research zone and special research zone uh, in this so-called MPA. So that's our research focus. What is interesting in the conservation measure 9105 that established the Rossi region MPA is it mentioned specifically research fishing in its paragraph six uh, that could happen in the general protection zone and creo research zone. And then also the directed fishing uh, that could uh, that could occur in a special research zone and creole research zone. These are new terms, uh, in in my opinion, because in international fisheries law, uh, for example, in the United Nations Convention on the Law of Sea and also in the Fish Stocks Agreement, uh, 1995, what we normally see uh, the the common terms used are like exploratory fisheries. Or like in the in the whaling case, what we see is uh, in the International Whaling Commission, uh, they use like fishing for scientific purposes. So then that kind of really triggered my interest uh, from first place when I when, when we see and we actually Cassandra, uh, Jianye, uh, and Nikki, we all witnessed the entry into uh, the kind of the establish, establishment of the Rossi Regional MPA uh, during the Kamala meetings. But I think it's immediately that came into my uh, interest is. What does that mean? What does this term mean? Because they are really actually very, uh, for lawyers, they are actually very uh, exceptional terms when it comes to uh, fishing. So then this paper, uh, which is still in uh, working progress uh, that I co-authored uh, with Alexander Pross and Valentin Schatz is to look into, are they different? Are they really different terms from what we normally know as exploratory fisheries and fishing for scientific purpose? Or actually they are the same? And also in whatever terms, because these terms have been mentioned and it's very important for the implementation of the Rossi region MPA and also the implementation of the Rossi region MPA will have a, a kind of very uh, important kind of uh, impact on the establishment of, uh, of new uh, 
Southern Ocean MPAs in the future. So what is the best and most efficient way to regulate this kind of research fishing in order to reconcile conservation and development? I steal this uh, picture from Cassandra. <laughs> so just long story short, when we are talking about the Kamala or when we are talking about uh, Southern Ocean MPAs, what exactly are we talking about? We are actually talking about a battle well, maybe this is a very tense word, a battle between conservation state and fishing state over the past uh, decades. The Convention on the Conservation of uh, uh, Antarctic Marine Living Resources was established in 1980s that with the aim to deal with the kind of the potential overfishing or illegal, illegal unreported and unregulated fishing in the Southern Ocean. So the I think the, the, the principle of the Kamala is to, as, as indicated in the, in the Article 2 of the Convention, is indeed to reconcile the interests between the conservation state on the one hand and the fishing state on the other hand. But over the years, and as, let's not, as, we, can, as, we, have been, as we, we can observe, and this is not the only case happening in Kamala, with, within the International Whaling Commission, we have seen the same trend that even though there is the, the original treaty or convention was set to reconcile the two interests, there is a gradual shift in within those international bodies towards conservation. And this is, this is perfectly reflected in Cassandra's picture about that the supporting, I mean, the approval, uh, the, the, the process for countries to support uh, the Ross Sea MPA. So you see, countries, for example, Japan and South Korea, I mean, they are fishing states, but they, so they are not the first ones at the forefront to, 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 in, to kind of call for the protection uh, to establish the uh, 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 Rossi MPAs, but gradually they join the conservation group and leaving less and less a country behind. And so now it's only, uh, so for the Rossi case is China and Russia. I think now for the uh, other three MPA proposals in the Southern Ocean, in the Kamala uh, on the table at the moment, the op 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 positions are only coming from uh, China and Russia. So now let's come back to these specific terms that has been established in the Rossi uh, region MPAs. In the general protection zone, it talks about research fishing that can be conducted in accordance with Conservation Measure 2401. It's very strict. Very strict requirements come after regulating research fishing. Research fishing. So it's, uh, I won't. I don't need to go to details. But basically, you see, if if any country, uh, any vessel from any country, they tr they try to catch more than fifty tons of fin fish, for example, then the notification requirement will be triggered to the to the Kamala Secretariat. And then they need to, the country, the, the fishing country needs to submit a, a, a research plan for the scientific committee of the Kamala for approval. And then for the each vessel needs to have at least two scientific observers uh, be on board. This is very unique uh, and, and very, very uh, good practice in the fishing industry so far throughout all the fishing activities within the fishing period. And also the research, research fishing vessels must a fulfilled reporting requirements. Currently, like within the season, it's five days per report. So that's quite, quite uh, kind of uh, strict. So within this general protection zone, I think there, I would say it's, it's very clear that general protection zone is more or less like no take. And even for the research fishing, fishing is for research. The more tricky ones, are in the special research, research zone and also creole research zone. Even though we see, for example, for the special research, research zone, the purpose of establishing this zone is to better, better gauge the if, ecosystem effects of climate change and fishing, provide opportunities for better understand the Antarctic marine ecosystem, to underpin the tooth fish stock assessment, and so on and so on. But, when it comes to the fishing activities in the special research zone, it is so-called directed fishing. The regulation of the directed fishing is actually uh, referred to Conservation Measure 5104 for 
krills and fifty one and forty one oh nine for toothfish. They are both about exploratory fisheries. So, so even though the the special the purpose of special research zone is to understand is to help understand the marine ecosystem, but the potential the potential directed fishing activities to be conducted in the zone is actually regulated uh, according to uh, uh, the rules established by Kamala regarding exploratory fisheries. And this is a similar case in Creole uh, research zone because for the Creole research zone, the purpose is, is of the zone is designed to investigate life's history, uh, hypotheses, biological parameters, ecological re relationships, and the variations of biomass just to understand. But once again, it also refers to uh, conservation measure 5104. Uh, regarding exploratory fisheries. So this comes back to a very standard process of the Kamala's management of fisheries. That is first establish new fishery and then conduct an exploratory fishery. But as we as commonly understand in international fisheries law, if you are going to conduct, I mean, as a country, uh, if you are going to conduct exploratory fishery, which is to evaluate distribution, abundance, and demography of the targeted species, and potential impact of fisheries on the species, and so on and so on. So when, if, when you start conducting exploratory fishery, the next step that, that kind of goes without saying, the next step is to start commercial fisheries. So, so here comes the problem. Here comes the problem. It's, it's a problem on paper because no such kind of directed fishing or research fishing have massively uh, begun. But here comes the problem on paper. That is, okay, it looks like if we are going, to, so we have established two zones, special research zone and career research zone within the Ross Sea region MPA uh, to, to, to still better understand the uh, ecosystems using a different term. But then this term, if it's going to be implemented, it could possibly be implemented as the same as other part of Kamala uh, to conduct exploratory fishery. So here is a, this is a problem. And there is even, uh, there is another issue which is connected, interconnected with these uh, two zones is uh, a proposal from Chinese delegation, which is echoed by Russian delegation regarding the, uh, regarding the to establish the research and, monit uh, research and monitoring plan in uh, in the MPAs, so uh, I don't need I don't want to go into I don't have time to go into details, but but pretty much this research and monitoring plan is very interesting because for the Chinese delegation, my understanding is research monitoring a very detailed and concrete research monitoring plan is supposed to be the precondition for establish and for the establishment of any new MPA, while for many other kind of members of Kamala, uh, a, a, a IMP should not be a precondition for the establishment, rather it should be a plan for the con for the conduct of the conduct of the scientific effort after an MPA has been established. But also very interestingly, in the Chinese submission, it also discussed the meaning of research, while also the research is means better understanding of marine ecosystem without any conservation goals. So, so once again, here comes to our internal conclusion. That is, all right. What we see this, this this creole research zone and uh, and also the special research zone uh, when it comes to research fishing and directed fishing, they are actually political driven. I mean, they this looks look like the pragmatic compromise between conservation states and fishing states to 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 reach a consensus to establish Ross Sea Marine uh, Ross Sea Region Marine Protected Area, which are left deliberately vague. So the vagueness is there. So it really depends on how the Kamala members we ultimately implement those research or exploratory fishing in the Ross Sea Region MP. And I guess this is a very tricky issue to be observed. And also uh, there are uh, pessimistic commentators like Julia Jabu saying, uh, saying in one paper that if misinterpreted and misused, this research fishing could lead to very uh, kind of similar results uh, as arising from the article eight of the scientific research whaling uh, permitted by under the International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling conducted by Japan. So that's what I'm saying. So you see, this is the same kind of a kind of narrative going on between kind of conservation state and and, and also the uh, fishing state, not only just in in Kamala. That's why 
our, this is only the interim, interim conclusion because we are still going to compare first the, what's the practice in IWC and also what, what's, what's, what's the meaning of and how the research fishing was regulated in the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement to, to come back to further interpret the meanings of the research fishing, fishing in the Ross Sea region MPA. And, but also there are kind of a, a positive, uh, let's say optimistic commentators, for example, Richard Cadell. And he, he comments that if still, if Kavala's Ross Sea exploratory fisheries is a reliable barometer of, barometer of regulatory intent, then these exploratory fisheries in commercial transition are likely to be subject to additional and ongoing research requirements absent from fully managed fisheries. So because it's it, because that that term is not kind of a so because the exploratory fisheries fishery is not kind of delib is not kind of a, uh, specifically used in the Ross Sea region MPA. So it's, so this research fishing this term is now in a very interesting kind of kind of uh, kind of situation to be further elaborated by the Kamala practice and I think that's something we uh, we 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 need we need to watch over the coming years and this is uh, this is just our interim interim conclusion and we are plan we are planning to finish our paper with comparison from uh, whaling regime and Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement uh, this month, if not next month, and hopefully, if you guys want uh, to read the full paper, uh, I can send send it over uh, in the second half of this year. So thank you very much. That's my presentation. Thank you, thank you, Professor Liu, and um, very very interesting um, topic and a very interesting comparative studies between the exploratory fishing in a camera and um, experimental willing in in the context of IWC. Uh, that's very interesting and uh, uh, your research highlights another some uh, uh, very interesting points uh, such as um, uh, res uh, research, research for fisheries uh, for scientific purpose. And uh, I think that's a very interesting to, that's a very important point because, uh, because uh, we see, we understand that in the South Ocean, the freedom of the scientific research in the high seas is um, protected in, in the UNCLOS and also uh, protected by the Antarctic Treaty system, Antarctic Treaty itself and also you highlighted i think i, I you highlighted the, the the relationship between the conservation states and the fish states i'm not sure that it's a quite correct the the, the wording the, the battle <laughs> i'm not sure but uh, yeah i think that um uh, uh it's a kind of way that the the, the different states uh, find the way to reach the compromise uh, you you know what recognize the interest i think they say uh, that they, they, they i think that they are in the way in the process to find the compromise between themselves and also uh explore, you mentioned you distinguish distinguish um, exploratory fishing from the commercial fishing um i'm not sure it's quite in, correct in the in the context of camera. If you say the exploratory fisheries is a non-commercial fishing activity, it's, um, uh, it's, very, it's very interesting. <laughs> but actually from my understanding that the, the new, ex there are some discussion, there they they have been some discussions in the camera itself about the relationship between the exploratory fishing, that means uh, conservation measure, 21 or uh, two, if I understand, uh, remember correctly. And uh, uh, on one side and the, on the other side is um, between the conservation measure uh, 24 or one, that Emily mentioned that. Uh, there's some discussions between uh, on these issues, on the relationship. What's the difference? What's them? Um, could they could some uh, streamlines these two kinds of, these two conservation measures? 
uh, th that's a very interesting point you raised. Uh, so, so I I think that sure we uh, our four speakers have finished the presentations, and uh, I think uh, I asked attendees if if you have any questions and you could put on the QR functions. I think uh, I have saw that they have. There are some questions. There are some questions that have already been answered by our speakers. Oh, so uh, I, if I if I may, I open the floor for discussion. If our speakers could have some other questions or comments for our four uh, topics. If if I may, step yeah, in. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, thank you to to everyone for the for the great talks, and I feel like a lot of what we said complements each other and also creates some dialogue around uh, around things. And um, Nenge, in particular, I'm really interested in your ideas around conservation states versus fishing states, um, especially when I think about the case of the Ross Sea, where New Zealand led the effort as much as the U.S. and yet they're a major fishing country in Kamalar, um, Australia fishes a lot, France fishes a lot. So some of these countries that are actually leading these conservation efforts are actually major fishing countries as well. Um, and I think that's a really interesting thing in the case of Kamlar that we have, uh, we have it. So it's less of a dichotomy to me and a more complicated picture, but I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks, Patricia. I guess that is, uh, I think that, that that dichotomy is kind of more like, a, uh, I would say uh, from a policy uh, perspective, perspective rather than uh, from a kind of a, a practice perspective, because yeah, most countries are, 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 are let's say most countries have a commercial fishing industry. Uh, but I must say, for example, the United States is a very is a very special case, if I understand correctly. It's like actually, the United States doesn't really have a very large uh, commercial fishing fleet. So I mean, even though there are uh, fishing vessels, I'm sure from the United States, but. Uh, that's kind of like it, I, I would I would what I would I would I'm trying to depict is like uh, countries from the policy a lot of policy uh, kind of perspective they, they are gradually uh, shifting towards supporting the conservation efforts in the international level and that that's that's kind of creates a lot of struggles as we have been observing uh, first uh, begins in the within the international Whaling commission because. It's kind of similar, uh, similar kind of a, 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 a debate there. Say uh, the, the commission was established to regulate whaling industry, but gradually it's shifted to become a very much a conservation focused body. And the Kamala, in my opinion, is going through the same kind of trend. And that's why what the, the struggle that we have been we have been watching at the moment uh, was a struggle of the establishing of the MPAs can be interpreted in that sense. That is, well, this is not particular country per se that they do they do or do not have fishing uh, interest or activities it's rather like more and more countries especially uh if i can if i can if i if, if i if i may say it, uh, in a more simple in a, in a kind of a very arbitrary way is like the more, most of western countries tend tend to become very supportive of the conservation efforts uh, in, in, uh, when it comes to fisheries, and then leave the rest of the world, I think, still trying to catch up, I would say, trying to catch up. But as, as Leslie pointed out in, in her opening speech, uh, and I was very uh, kind, of a, kind of stuck once again, it's like now only 13% of the global ocean is untouched by human beings. And like even Antarctica is such a heavily impacted by human beings. So I, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, so I, 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 my hope is every country at the end of the day should become a conservation state. But of course, when, 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 you all, when everyone becomes a conservation state, it doesn't mean that it doesn't allow any fishing activities. Still, so it's it will become a more nuanced debate. Like how do we how do we mean by conservation? And I think that 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 special research zone and and Creo research zone established within the Rossi MPA could become a an example to to further give further details, not just slogan, but details 
how to reconcile those interests. Uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of my 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 yeah further explanation. But I, I do have a question for for you, Professor Tang. Uh, I think it's a good opportunity <laughs> to catch you here. And you know, this year is a very important uh, kind of a momentum that. Uh, the Sun Ocean, three Sun Ocean MPA proposals will once again be discussed in uh, in Kamala. Do you have any prediction for for the discussions coming in October? <laughs> so especially, what's the what's the what do you see? I mean, very. Uh, this is only just for for your personal view. What do you see the any possible interaction between the CBD uh, COP fifteen and Kamala uh, MPAs? Oh, come on, annual meeting in general, <laughs> not necessarily MJs. Yes, it's only our personal view. No pressure. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, as, a, as I said in the first time to uh, attend this um, global dialogue in my, in my personal capacity, and uh, I'm very, I'm very interested, uh, pleased to, to, to be part of this uh, global di di dialogue. It's very important. And uh, as for your questions, I, I think that uh, so far, um, I have not been contacted sure, with, uh, with, uh, by some members or authorities. So uh, I, I have seen some momentum has been built, uh, built uh, outside um, around the world. Uh, for instance, you may notice that the, the April, in, in April um, 15, uh, EU has um, hosted uh, the online the meetings and uh, EU invites to more than, I think that uh, 15 member state, uh, states to have uh, some uh, discussion on the MPA issues. And then after that, they have a joint statement. I think that's uh, the momentum is there. I think that's a, that's a, um, that's a signal. Or the, that's a that's a, the trend is uh, obvious. So that depends. Um, uh, and uh, relating to in relation to um, these issues, had I think that uh, your presentation had has has some um, relation uh, have, has uh, say something about this conservation and fishing or something like that. Uh, I think that uh, I think that uh, you also say that about RMPs, research and the monitoring um, plans. I think that uh, uh, the science is very important to build the consensus among members. Uh, I I agree with that. Uh, I think that if member states have very have a re agreed or have consensus on scientific issues, that it will be easier for them to discuss uh, other other issues. That's my personal point. Uh, uh, with respect to your presentation, I think I had to, I, I, uh, I followed the Cassandra's uh, comments. I would like to, uh, to highlight one point. You, you, you talk a lot about the exploratory fishing. Um, I think that you should be understand that uh, exploratory fishing in context of camera is part of the implementation of precautionary approach. So it, it, I, in this uh, sense, uh, it, it's, I, in, from my personal view, it's not appropriate to equate, equate um, exploratory fishing in camera. In, with um, experimental, experimental welling in context of IWC, it's totally different. Uh, if you if you go to look at back to the the, the history, uh, I, one point I would like to make is um, uh, in 1991. If you if you like to make reference to that point uh, report. 1991 scientific report. That's a year that uh, the camera adopted the conservation measure for the re new fisheries. And uh, two years after they adopted the conservation measure for exploratory fisheries. 
one, one issue at that year, 1991, prompted the camera adopt the conservation measure for new fisheries. So in that year, United States issued a permit for a vessel to the South Ocean with a catch quote of 1,000 tons for crab. That's very interesting. Uh, that's very interesting. So that's a, that's a, that's a some point you could look at, look at. So as a chair, I think that we have uh, some uh, questions. The first question is, uh, uh, are they competing scientific models to predict long-term sustainability of the current fishing practice in the Southern Ocean? How can we evaluate them objectively when we need to adopt one over the others? This is about the science. Um, uh, the attendees did not point which, he, uh, which, which is because he preferred to answer his questions. Cassandra, uh, or do, do you like to answer these questions? Um, I, I can try. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, and perhaps yes. you are and and Professor Tang, you are welcome to to uh, contribute as well as Nikki or, or anyone else um, who wants to as well. But yeah, I mean the main fisheries are for krill and toothfish, um, and for toothfish, uh, a lot of that work is done through work stock. Uh, sorry, the the uh, stock assessments that the um, fisheries. Sorry, I'm like it's late here. <laughs> Working group on fish stock um, assessments works on, uh, and so they they have a pretty standard way of doing it. Um, krill, on the other hand, there are many competing <laughs> uh, things happening, really exciting uh, movements happening for managing krill in, in terms of trying to incorporate more environmental change and um, incorporating more small scale management so that we can have more sustainable krill fisheries. Uh, krill fisheries have really gotten more concentrated. There's more and more pressure to fish krill. So there's a lot of excellent work going on. And, and Nikki, you're welcome to, to chime in on that if you want to as well. Um, and I think krill, krill is one of those ones that it is, it is so important to the food web in the Southern Ocean. So many things eat it that we really need to factor in uh, the fishing industry as a predator <laughs> in that way to understand how to sustainably manage it. But Nikki, is, is there more you'd like to add to that? Sure, I can talk a little bit more about the krill scientific models. So I think I mentioned in my talk about this work plan that Kamler agreed to for krill. So there are three main parts of that work plan, but basically Kamler agreed to a certain set of methods they were going to progress. So the first piece was, you know, they did a new krill survey in 2019 and based on those new krill data, they wanted to look at the sustainability of the fishery. So they are agreeing to use a model, um, a stock assessment single species model called a generalized yield model. Um, and then they've also agreed to use this risk assessment model, which, which makes it more ecosystem based. And that's the piece about krill that's different from toothfish, right? Because toothfish are more managed from a single species perspective, but krill, it's, it's more ecosystem based. But Kamler has agreed to those models. They're each kind of being led by a group of countries within Kamlar or with the collaboration of the Secretariat. But the working group meetings themselves, um, you know, include all the members. So all of those members act to objectively um, to review those and, and kind of serve as a peer review process. Um, and there are also external models that can validate things. I was talking about some of the work that Pew funded that, um, you know, provided a little bit of external evaluation. And I know there's other work going on. You know, for example, one country might be leading on the model that's actually been agreed to by Kamlar while another country is doing kind of a management strategy evaluation. So I do think that um, Kamlar has, at least for the krill fishery, agreed to a process. Um, and there are some mechanisms in place to evaluate how effective that is. We still have uh, two questions, one for Nayi, one and one for Cassandra. The 
questions for the Nanye is, uh, uh, the question is uh, as follows. Given the massive exploitation of the ocean in the period since the IWC and then since camera was established in 1981, isn't it entirely understandable that there would be more pressure for conservation? We have damaged the ocean so much, we have to leave space for nature or we all suffer. Regenerate or protect are essential for planetary health and human health. This is a question for you, Naya. Okay, thank you. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I <laughs> have no doubt that we as human beings have damaged the ocean so much. And I, I'm horrified every day, I mean, by any presentation reading that I have been doing. But I guess my presentation, especially from an international lawyer's perspective, that is, uh, you know, when we are trying to interpret the established treaties, it's not just like, wow. Well, I mean, this, this kind of, this kind of uh, effect or context definitely matter, but also we do need to respect what was agreed upon when the treaty, uh, when the treaty was negotiated and established by all the con con contracting parties. So there is one, one, there is one possible, I wouldn't even call it a school of scholars uh, kind of trying to link, uh, link to the so-called progressive explanation of the, of the treaty, but then the, the fundamental uh, principle of the contemporary international law is consent based. So, I mean, some countries can have a progressive explanation of the treaty provisions, but then because a treaty is consent based by every single uh, contracting party. So then as so other contracting party could have could uh, could legitimately have different or different or kind of different interpretation or maintain the original uh, interpretation uh, when they agreed upon that treaty. So that's also totally legitimate. I think this, this is where I come from. Uh, not, not to deny any fact that we so much damage to the planet, but we do have rules and, and which is consent-based uh, cons consent based contemporary international law to interpret those relevant treaties. Thank you, thank you, Naya. The last question is for the Cassandra. The question is, um, I was wondering, as you mentioned, uh, this is from Mao Zhengjiang. Uh, um, his question is about, uh, as you mentioned, on equal economic trade of to what extent do you think the trade offs among different interests may influence the independence of scientific research in the South Ocean. Is the, the arrangement of science-based decision-making regime still effective and appropriate in current situation? That's a question for you. Cassandra. Thanks so much. I, I'll try to answer it uh, quickly, given, <laughs> given the hour and that we're coming to the end of our session. Um, yeah, I mean, I presented in my talk mostly on the political process, mostly on getting consensus. Um, at least in the case of the Ross Sea, there was extensive science done for many years, um, led by New Zealand, led by the United States in collaboration with other countries. Um, and all of that science was put together and presented to Kamlar Scientific Committee, which did agree that the proposals were based on the best available science actually very quickly in 2011. And so, um, yeah, the, the science process at Kamlar, it, it, as uh, Emily showed in some of her slides, there's a whole series of working groups that, that science has to go through. There is a very rigorous scientific process, including towards marine protected areas. I think one challenge is that it is often scientists, uh, as you mentioned, that maybe are working with the fishing industry or have some connection to economic interests um, in Kamlar there aren't uh, often aren't independent scientists in the room, although they can be invited to some of the groups, but often it is folks who come in under national delegations. Um, however, we do have 
there are scientists who come in the room through the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research and other groups who are able to participate in the process. Um, but I think I think there could be room for more independent scientists to contribute um, to to the process, uh, the MPA process, the the fishing uh, setting up fishing management rules as well. Um, but I do think the science based decision making is is effective, uh, you know, so far in Camelar. It's very it's very strong, as many of us have presented on. Thank you. Thank you, Kasaja. And uh, before we end, we have just have one quick question. I think this is uh, for Nico Brandon. The question is uh, very simple. The, uh, the question is, um, is there official registration that camera retains when lobby groups meeting a cause? Sure. So officially, the work that I do with Pew is not considered lobbying by US definitions. Uh, but in terms of the NGO engagement in Camlar, I think the best way to have a clear record of that and whether um, certain NGOs are attending meetings is to look at the meeting reports and look at the list of attendees. So you can look at the Camlar um, Commission and the Scientific Committee re meeting reports, look at the ASOC delegation and see who's attending as part of those meetings. Okay, so that brings our to the end of this uh, special session on the protection of Southern Ocean. And uh, I would just thank you all the four speakers uh, for the presentation and to the comments and re uh, in relation to the questions raised during the pre uh, session. And uh, thank you, thank you all again. And I will, reach, I will give the floor to Naya. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I think we had a fascinating session, uh, and uh, which uh, was uh, done on time. So, <laughs> so <laughs> and I was a little bit kind of concerned. Maybe there are not many questions, but I think we raised a lot of uh, uh, kind of interesting discussions and debates, and uh, we, we will continue. And uh, yes, so I would just now leave uh, some housekeeping uh, announcement to Sarah, well, and we will come back at uh, two p.m for our next session on decolonization and indigenous approach to uh, biodiversity conservation. Okay, bye for now, everyone.